All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Master Motivation Show. My name is Jason Flame, and I am joined today by our very special guest, Master Karen. How are you today? Good. Everything's good on this side of the world. How about with you? Everything is great. Uh, I'm here in sunny California. It is about 90 degrees today, and I know you're coming from Colorado, correct? Yeah, and we have a winter storm warning in effect, and we're going to get up to six inches of snow. <laughs> I don't think that uh, I don't think I will ever see snow where I am. We'd have to go about two hours to get snow, but you guys get you guys get a whole range of of seasons up there, and you got the warm, you got the cold, you got the whole deal. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, springtime in the Rockies. Pretty crazy. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as I was chatting with you before we got started, the whole purpose of having you on the show today is because, you know, for 2021, I chose 52 people that I wanted to highlight that I felt were motivating and inspiring in my life and would be inspiring to others. So I'm really excited to share your story today. I'm honored to be here. Thanks, Jason. It's really good to see you again. Yeah, so it's been a little bit, you know, we, um, I, I mentioned that we've met at the Super Show several times. I stopped by the booth, said hi. Um, I actually just finished reading your book for the second time again before uh, doing the interview. Um, I am a martial artist. I, I really, really enjoyed reading that um, for the second time. I think I probably read it about 10 years ago when I, when I first bought it. Still have your inscription in it, which was awesome. And um, a lot of great stories. So before we get into talking about the book and your, your history, you're a seventh degree black belt in Tong Soo Do, correct? That's correct. I want to, I want to like introduce you a little bit more from your background in the beginning. If you could just let everybody know a little bit more about you, maybe, uh, you know, earlier days, and then we'll just kind of go through from there. Okay. And, and what, what year of my life do you want to start with? <laughs> how about we how about we start with year one from birth? Where were you born and, and where were you raised? Talk about your childhood a little bit. Okay, um, sure. So I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, because my father was in medical school at that time at um, University of Tennessee. And um, I actually uh, grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, because that's where he had his internship at the Roanoke Memorial Hospital. My mom is um, of mixed, mixed ethnicity, but she was born in Tokyo, Japan. So she has the uh, Japanese nationality. And um, my childhood isn't something that uh, is a, a, probably a very pleasant story, but uh, I use it as a catalyst to try to minister and help other people who are going through tough times, which we can get into, which is why I started my martial arts program in the ghetto uh, of Denver 20 years ago. But I mean, a long story short, I'll tell you this, um, Jason, and I haven't really said this uh, in a lot of my blogs and shows that I've been on, but uh, I, I was uh, at one point going to be part of a murder-suicide at the age of three. And uh, I always say I thank my Lord and Savior because I'm here today, and I know because I'm here, I'm supposed to be doing some good things. Well, you have definitely done some great things. A lot of um, it, you started to talk about your programs that, as you said, that you've started in the ghetto uh, for underprivileged children and uh, with, with martial arts being your vehicle to help minister to youth. And so talk a little bit more about that childhood. What was it like growing up, um, at, you know, mixed ethnicity? What, what was that like? Right. So um, my mom is basically uh, Asian and uh, Chukchi tribe, which is, which is American Indian. And uh, my father is European descent and also Cherokee. So um, I have about 14 nationalities documented. <laughs> I, I identify heavily with the Native American side um, and I do a lot of my work in Native American tribal areas. And they, they have a, a real problem with our, our sisters. Um, they're just literally falling off the face of the earth. And, and the, the program that I help try to uh, make a difference in is with the missing and murdered indigenous women. And I just got back, matter of fact, from the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, where I teach self-defense and hold clinics for the women in that area, because uh, not a whole lot's being done with that. But um, I, 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 you know what, I, I, I feel a calling to help with the Native America, but uh, I'm, I'm basically just someone who is of service to to my father, God, and, and I don't really think of it outside of that. Were you, did you face some challenges, you know, um, 
being of Asian descent and, and Native American, did you feel any prejudice or did you feel any um, anything that maybe someone else might be feeling that you can relate to? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in the South at a time where if, you know, if you didn't look like everybody from the South, um, you were going to um, you were going to get bullied. And I was part of that. I was a very different looking girl. Um, you know, I, I can remember uh, people like slanting their eyes in the hall at me and looking at me and pointing and and making innuendos. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's so much like that now because I actually do go into some of the public school districts and I don't think it's like that anymore ethnicity is way more acceptable with uh, the later generations. But, you know, when we were growing up, uh, it was quite a challenge to be different. And it's not just your ethnicity. If you were too fat, if you were too skinny, I mean, it didn't matter. If you look different, uh, you were going to get picked on. And uh, so, yeah, I had a rough time at school and I still remember those times. And I always laugh because a lot of the people that were uh, kind of ostracizing me or making fun of me now are just, they don't, we're friends on Facebook and they like, don't remember it, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> right. Right. You know, you know, it's, so, it's interesting yeah. that way too. It's interesting that, um, you know, you talk about bully behavior just in general and how, um, how the bully can view it very different than how you, you remember. And, and if you were to talk to them and bring it up to them, they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like it was nothing to them but it so right. sticks deep with you. How did that affect your mindset and, and just your general uh, psychology as a child? Um, you know, and then, you know, getting martial arts that gives you so much confidence. How, how did that really affect you? Um, you know, it did affect me. Not only that, but my home life wasn't very good. I came from a broken home and my mother, rest in peace, struggled with uh, emotional and personality disorders. Um, and my dad was, uh, was gone. I mean, he left when I was three. And so um, I grew up in very unfortunate situations. I, I wasn't um, uh, very well taken care of. And, and, you know, my needs weren't being met as a child. And I know uh, Child Protective Services came out like three times. And, and um, you know, for, for whatever reason, that was something that I had to go through. But I know that it, it helped to mold me into who I am today. And who I am today is a woman with a very soft heart for kids of all ethnicities that are struggling and going through hard times because when you're a kid, you can't do anything about it. You know, I always say um, that my causes always are, are centered around kids and pets because they, they are, they're helpless and um, what they go through will affect them later in life. And it, it certainly affected me and it still affects me today. I mean, you would be surprised. People think I'm so outgoing and accomplished, but it's very interesting because I talk about this in my own blog. Um, I don't feel that, you know, <laughs> like, I, I, I know I, I, I look at the paper of all the things I've done. I'm like, I know most people haven't done the things I've done, but I still don't feel that sense of accomplishment. I, I still don't feel a lot of things. And uh, I guess in a good way, it keeps me humble. But I mean, it's something that affects you in your life when you grow up that way. So I'm fully aware of it. Well, thank you for sharing all of that and being candid and, and vulnerable enough to speak about it because there's a lot of people that may feel that same way, but just, you know, sometimes you feel alone. Sometimes you don't feel like you're understood. And for somebody to hear you talk about this, you know, we talk about the ripple effect of how we can change many lives through changing one life at a time. And so, uh, again, thank you for sharing all of that. And let's, let's talk about you know, your martial arts background. You're also an accomplished author. Uh, you have your podcast series. You are a newscaster. Um, you've done so much, like you said. So let's talk about the martial arts a little bit. Okay. Uh, and specifically, uh, you ask me the questions and I'll answer them because I'm not real sure. I mean, we're talking 30 years of teaching and training here. So you let me know where you want, how far you want to go back with that. Well, let, let's walk it through. How did you get involved in martial arts? Well, actually, it's something I've always wanted to do when I was a kid. I remember being like nine or 10 years old and just wishing I could take martial arts lessons. And because of my family situation, we didn't have any money. I mean, there were times that, you know, we didn't have enough money for food to eat at dinner. So I, I there's no way I was going to be able to take any type of, of martial arts class. And I never forgot that. But as soon as I became a young woman and gainfully employed, the first thing I did was sign up for martial arts lessons. And at the time I was working for 
uh, an a, a NBC affiliate in Pittsburgh, we're right outside of Pittsburgh in that market. And um, I just, back then we had something called yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> You know, let your fingers do the walking. So I literally looked up and I made all the phone calls of the martial arts schools. And the one that impressed me the no most was uh, uh, Master C.S. Kim out of Pittsburgh. And he was so dynamic on the phone. And he actually answered the phone, which is very unusual that a high ranked master at a school will even answer the phone. But he did. And I tell you what, I was sold by the time I got off that phone. I, I walked in there and, and started taking lessons off the street as a white belt. And I, I never looked back. And it's been 30 years. That's amazing. That's a, that's a great story. So, you know, unlike a, a lot of people that I've talked to so far, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a childhood activity. It wasn't, you know, mom and dad got you involved. It was your decision, your choice, because it was something that you always wanted to do. What was it about martial arts that always intrigued you? You know, I couldn't really answer that question. And I've had people ask me that, but, uh, a couple of things I didn't realize when I did the genealogy on my mom's side that I actually traced back to Shogunate, Samurai Warriorship, uh, two times over. Uh, I, I have lineage on my, my family kimono, which is almost 200 years old. That, that kaimon on there dates me back to the house of Oda Nobunaga, which is a very famous Edo period Samurai Warrior. So um, that might have been in my blood, a little bit kicking. But when people would ask me that, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, what could it be? Then I realized that... It wasn't about, you know, they're like, do you like to beat up people? You're angry or whatever. No, it's not that at all. Um, it's really not about mastering other people. It, it was really about mastering myself. And um, I, I learned how to do that with the aid of martial arts. And that's about the best answer that I can give. Excellent. I mean, I, I can plug your book again. I am a martial artist. You, you talk about so many different stories relating to what you learned in your training and, and brought that into your, into your life. Um, Dane Evans, a student of mine is watching right now. I know. And I, I, Dane, I have her book in my car so that you can read it. Um, but you know, talk about your first, you know, beginning as a young woman in martial arts, because in those days, it was pretty uncommon. Women didn't take martial arts as much then. There weren't as many kids then. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't really a business. It was. It was. It was all about the art. And so, talk about what it felt like to train in those early days. Well, Tang Sudo um, under Master C. S. Kim, who is considered uh, a founding father of that art form in this country. Um, it, it's. You know, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it's very strict, and it has a lot of discipline to it, and it's a lot of yes, sir, and and uh, a lot of internal philosophy that you go by. You don't get promoted until you start to get the internal aspects of traditional martial arts. And uh, there there were maybe two or three women in my class at the time, but, li but like you said, it was predominantly men. Um, the people that I started training with back 30 years ago today, as far as I know, none of them are training or ever got that far. Matter of fact, uh, probably only a couple even made it to black belt. So it's kind of interesting to go back along that journey and see, well, who do I start with? How many made black belt? Okay, well, of all the black belts, how many made master? Of all the masters, how many made grandmaster? And I got to tell you, I don't know any of them outside of some of the teachers that are over me that actually made the rank of grandmaster, especially a female. So I look back and go, wow, I, I just, you know, I loved it. It was, um, you know, in the beginning, it was, uh, it was a little difficult, especially when I became pregnant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I still continue to train and nobody was really giving me any kind of a break because I was a girl or even that I was pregnant. I mean, I, mean, I was precautious, don't get me wrong. But um, I appreciate that because it, it helped make me a very, very strong person. And I wouldn't change anything about my training over the last 30 years. Absolutely. You know, I, it's one of the things that I appreciate most about martial arts, um, you, you know, true martial arts schools, that when you step out on the mat, you're a martial artist. You're nor man nor woman. It's, you're a martial mm -hmm. artist. And, and I know um, you remind me a lot of, of one of my instructors, uh, Tiffany Wing. Uh, at the time, it was Tiffany Schaefer. Schaefer uh, and, and Kathy Grunewald were two very, very strong women in our organization. And man, if you ever treated them like a woman, uh, they would literally beat you like a man. You know, it's like this thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was, and, and, and I always remember that because it was like, don't, they didn't want that special treatment. And, and I, again, I just think that it's so unique that you could step out on the martial arts floor and 
ethnicity goes away, male, female goes away, um, short, fat, tall, long, it doesn't matter. You're just there to train. And, and as you said earlier, uh, it, it's not about becoming a master. It's about mastering yourself. And, you know, one of the questions, uh, my student, Dane, he, he just wants to know, do you still train or are you training towards working on your eighth degree? Is that something that's in your goals? Yeah. You know what, Dane, I'm not going to stop. Um, as long as I can do it and physically am capable of doing it, I'm going to keep going. I still teach and I still have training sessions. Um, uh, I actually, uh, last spring, I flew up to Cleveland, Ohio and trained under Master A.J. Perry uh, to make sure that I, I had all my requirements to test for eighth degree black belt. And I, I'm seventh degree black belt. And I did that in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, under Joe Corley at uh, Gary Lee's Sport Karate Museum event. And, uh, you know, um, Don Willis, and I, I had a pretty heavy panel there judging me. So <laughs> I still make sure that I'm up on my requirements and doing uh, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm, I'm just going to keep on going. You know, I, they always say, if you do it right, it takes a lifetime and they'll open up your casket and put the, uh, the tent then in there. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> right. So well, that, know, that's probably going to be the case. <laughs> in, in our, um, in our organization, we have, uh, my instructor, uh, Dennis Ichikawa who trained with Chuck Norris, Pat Johnson. He's a ninth degree black belt. Um, he never believed in 10th degree because that went, it goes in your casket when you go. Um, right. And so he's a ninth degree. And then my instructor, Mark Cox, is an eighth degree. And I'm currently a seventh degree. And I can't really test for eighth degree until my instructor moves up or moves on. So mm -hmm. it, it's just kind of interesting when you get to those higher levels, too. It's all about just staying with it, teaching, contributing. You know, I think that's the, the, the most important factor as a high ranking grandmaster is that we are continuing to contribute to the art. Right. That's the most important. Um, right. my, my question for you about becoming a black belt and becoming a master and a grandmaster, you know, I, I'm sure that when you were uh, training early on, there weren't very many masters or grandmasters. And it was, it was rarely even a term that was, that was actually used. As a matter of fact, like some of the belts, it was, it was just, you were a black belt. You know, you didn't see mm -hmm. the black belt with the red stripe or anything like that. Um, but my question goes beyond that. Do you think that because of how hard it was early on and because of, um, you know, just the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The expectations. Do you think that we weeded out people that needed martial arts the most? I don't. And here's why. I think that people, um, and it's still my experience today, people that are hungry for this are going to go in and they're going to keep at it. Um, a lot of people will come off the street and try it and quit within, you know, weeks to maybe a matter of months. And I, I really question if they really had what it take to continue that journey. Jason, not everybody can be a black belt. And I have to keep that in mind as an instructor. Not everybody can do it or everybody would do it. It takes a very special person to continue and to black belt and, and, and so forth. And um, I, I think that uh, that, you know, if they're a spiritual person and on that spiritual journey, that they will come to find what they need to help them along the way. And if it's not, you know, me or martial arts or whatever, that's OK. I, I just don't argue with it anymore, you know. And do you think it's also the responsibility of the instructor, the school owner, the higher ranks to pull that out of them as well, though? You know, I, I think that you, you want to encourage them. Um, uh, I think you want to point out their strengths because a lot of people that come in don't realize how strong they really are. And you as a teacher, I mean, you see it right off the bat in your mind. You're going, my gosh, if this this student continues like this, they're going to be way better than me. And a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes a strong, it takes a good teacher to be able to say that to them. But I'm willing to say that, listen, you keep this up. You're going to be way better than me someday. It won't take long. And, and that kind of encouragement, I think, is very important to let people know uh, personally that they have the, uh, the, the strength within them to continue. But outside of that, you know, I'm not, I've never been anyone to baby somebody or try to like, you know, come on, you know, um, you, it takes a certain special person to continue. 
and I've never been motivated. I mean, I had a, school, a commercial school for 10 years. Don't get me wrong. But uh, since then, in the last several years, I've never had to baby anybody because I've been doing it as a community service. So, um, <laughs> you know, if this isn't a fit, then God bless you. It's okay. Go find what you need to find. Excellent. I'm going to bring this comment up here real quick. Uh, David Starachi, uh, one of one of my instructors and mentors who will be on the show in, in just a few weeks, says, Master Karen, uh, not sure if I missed it, but have you ever had an extended break in your training? Any advice for those of us that are continuing the journey after so many years? Yeah, I did have to take a break, David. Actually, when I was a first degree black belt, uh, I, I just had I messed my knee up really bad. And um, I had to sit out for like nine months. But in that time, I was practicing some other art forms, uh, some softer forms with more of a Kung Fu influence, like uh, um, some other Mudokwan softer styles. And also uh, got into a little bit of yoga and, and Pilates, which I still teach today. And I actually incorporated into my class. So, you know, that does happen. Of course, when I was terribly pregnant, I couldn't train, but I still taught. Matter of fact, I taught up until. Um, a day before I delivered. And then I came back and taught three days after I delivered. So, I mean, that's just being a, a strong woman in, in body and being physically fit to, to be able to do something like that. But um, I have had those two times that I can remember in my 30 year career. Some of us, some of us would call that old school. I mean, that's, that's yeah. old school karate, right? I mean, you just, yeah, you just find a way. And, and, you know, you brought something up too, as we get more mature and more wise and understand our body as we're getting older, you know, our training definitely changes or we, mm -hmm. we modify our training. Um, you know, the, the hardcore blood and guts era of sparring when we were in our twenties and thirties is very different as we get to our forties, fifties, sixties. Um, that, that changes a ton. You brought up, you know, bringing in other styles of forms to soften the, the, the beating that our bodies can take. Right. Exactly. exactly. And, um, you know, you're exactly right. You have to go through, I went through a little bit of a period of adjustment where, you know, I went from competing, uh, nationally and even a competitor in some world tournaments. And I'm, I get to the point later on in my thirties where I, I can't, my back won't let me do it. Um, you know, and, and my knees and my hips and, and it took a little bit of adjustment of several years to realize what's going to work for me and what's not. And so I've discovered, you know, my routine. Now I've been working out religiously since I was 19. I used to teach aerobics before I did martial arts. So I finally came to a, an area of adjustment where I realized that I got to be good to myself. I don't want to be one of these people that has to get the hip replacement. And if I keep pushing myself, I know that's going to happen. Um, so I, I, I have modified and I've adjusted and I've combined a lot of, of, of routines between aerobics, Pilates, and yoga, and Tai Chi, and hard style martial arts that work well with me today, and I do incorporate that in my teaching. So you can do that. You just have to stick with it and see what's going to really work. And you you mentioned competition and tournaments early on. Uh, you were a successful competitor. Uh, you also uh, w you were able to translate your martial arts into film as well. So talk a little bit about the tournaments, and then let's talk a little bit about some of the films. Okay, I competed in both Tung Sudo and open style tournaments um, very early on, probably as a, what we know as a gup in Korean martial arts, which is red, yellow, green, and all that, uh, even up until about probably second degree black belt. And then I was just getting it to a point where my body couldn't handle that kind of competition anymore. Um, and so um, we had world championships in Tung Sudo, and I definitely was a competitor in that. I did okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was okay. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I wasn't the one that won all the time, but I had my wins and I had my losses. I encourage people to try competition and uh, not for the reason of coming home with any kind of a trophy, because trust me that trophies are just things that break and get dusty after a while, but to do it because you need to learn about yourself and you need to be able to master yourself. And that's a big part of it, being able to go against somebody else who has the same type and years of experience in martial arts that you do. So I highly encourage it. I specifically re remember reading uh, one of your articles in the book was about competition and, and, and testing yourself and getting outside of your comfort zone. Even though it might not be your thing, it's a way to test yourself to see what you have from within. 
Right. Exactly. You need to know that about yourself. You need to know what you're made of when you get in the ring. And I didn't really care to compete. It's an all day event. As you know, it's hard. And the higher you ranked you are, the longer you have to wait to compete. But you need that experience because it tests you as a human being to see how willing, how far and what, what you're capable in your mind of doing. It will challenge you. So I, I encourage everybody to compete when they get a chance. And do you keep up with competitions at all now? Do you watch competitions, attend competitions, and, and just kind of see what the scene is like now? I do. I was in Vegas um, last January helping out with the World Martial Arts Council. And usually in those situations, uh, you get put in as a judge or a ref, which I did. And so I don't mind. A lot of times I'll go and I'll do uh, speaking appearances or some kind of an engagement. And if it's a tournament, they'll always stick me on, you know, you need the black belts and somebody has to judge the black belts and somebody has to judge the masters. So if you can find someone that's a grandmaster to sit on the judging panel, you're very lucky because people do want to compete all the way up. So I usually get drafted right off the bat, kind of voluntold, you know, we need you to sit on the <laughs> panel. <laughs> voluntold, I love it. How do you feel about participation trophies? Um, you know, I'm very old school about that. Uh, I, 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 I have seen it in effect with my own son, who not only um, I trained at the age of four, and he got up to second Dan before he got into high school sports, and he now plays college football. But, you know, I remember when he was in wrestling, uh, before he was even in the fifth grade, they have recreational type wrestling. And um, I remember that everybody that wrestled got like some kind of a trophy. And so it got to the point, Jason, where I was seeing these little kids and when they got a third or fourth place trophy, they started crying going, mom, I lost. I mean, they know it doesn't matter if you don't win first or, you know, win second, they, they know that, you know, they didn't win. They don't care about the trophy. You, you can't, there's no way you're going to spin doctor that outside of what it really is. And people know in their heart what they really are. Just like when I meet someone who's, I, I was at an event that I met, an instructor. He was 21 years old and he was a 15th degree black belt. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, how can I get to be 15? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not, I didn't say anything. I, I mean, I laughed because obviously there's something, something going on some way <laughs> you know, that's about money here. But um, I think he knew in his heart that, you know, this is not a legitimate situation we're dealing with. And gosh, that's an awful feeling to walk around knowing that you're wearing something and you didn't really earn it. And you, you, you're, you're messing, you're messing with yourself more than anything when you take that route. Well, 15th degree black belt. I mean, that outranks master Ken. It really does. <laughs> if y'all know, if y'all know who Master Ken is, you want to go check out his uh, his YouTube channel. It's it, it's it's hilarious, but true all at the same time. Uh, Master Ken, he, he's a great guy. Actually, uh, it, it truly is a martial artist too, and and uh, part of another martial arts school. But I, I just I always think that that's funny because I think he has eleven or 12 or 13. I don't know. I don't know how many stripes he has on his belt. Well, hey, real quick. Let's say hi to uh, Johnny Foster. Johnny Foster saying hello. 71 and still teaching. Love it. I, I know Johnny. He's an Elvis impersonator. And we had a lot of good times and laughs in Vegas at an event. He trained in martial arts. And I believe his son was one of the Rangers, or if I'm not yep. mistaken. Yep. And Blake so, Foster. Yeah, good to see you, Johnny. And then Dane would like to know, um, there must have been some injuries along the way. What was the worst injury you've had training in martial arts? Honestly, Dane, the worst injury I've ever had is what I go through every day right now. And that's <laughs> back pain and hip pain. I mean, I live with it every day. I have part of a routine that I have to wake up and, and do a specific fluid intake that I do. It's a combination of a bunch of stuff that I won't talk about, but then I'll, I'll do, I'll go right into yoga, go right into Pilates, go into weight training at my house. And then uh, later on, I'll either go uh, teach and train or, you know, I'll get into, I, I try to walk three miles every day. And that's just a routine that works for me, but I'm feeling it. I mean, I'm feeling it right now that my injury has just been overextending myself in 30 years in the business, like probably you, probably Jason and everybody else who's done it for a while. 
you will feel it and you will live with it. But most professional athletes do live with pain every day. It's just the unfortunate truth that, you know, the, the amount of wear and tear that we put on our bodies, um, you know, you look at some of these uh, martial artists that started when they were three years old. And I mean, there's, there's just a lot of things that we do for our body, whether we were trained to do it or we were just not trained not to do it to protect our knees, to protect our back, you know, that at, at a certain level after so many years, um, you know, the parts you were given were not meant to be, uh, you know, as, <laughs> ext- you know, I mean, the, the kicking and the stretching we do is just insane, but let's talk about, um, y- you've been featured in a couple, a couple films, correct? That's correct. And what was that experience like? Was that, was that fun? Did you enjoy it? Was it by accident? Um, so I'll, I'll tell you what they are. First of all, the first one, uh, was, uh, stunt. I was a stunt player in a Van Damme movie. Um, John Claude Van Damme, you guys know, I don't know if your younger students know who that is, but, uh, it was a, a movie called sudden death that they were filming in Pittsburgh and they called on a lot of martial artists to help out with some stunt work. And, um, basically the, the plot of that movie is they blow up the civic arena. And then I guess when they melt the ice, all this water comes gushing down. So they literally dro- uh, dropped uh, 3000 gallons of water down that ramp and told us to run. I mean, <laughs> don't worry. I ran. <laughs> but, you know, and and the, the stunt work thing, it's not my thing. That was the one time that I did it. And I really never did it again. I don't really care for it. Then I had a feature role in a Cynthia Rothrock movie. Um, it was like 1997 called Sworn to Justice. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie. And I know this is something that most people don't think that people say that have been in movies, but I really don't care for it. Um, I really don't care about being in movies. Maybe at a younger time, I thought it would be really cool. And I did try it and I tried the stunt work thing. But it's just not my thing, Jason, especially at this time in my life. Um, I feel like I'm um, called to do other things. Uh, the, for the service of my father, God, and that's just not fitting in the role right now. So, I, you know, that's just not me. So I know it's weird, but it's not me. <laughs> and you brought up, uh, you brought up Cynthia Rothrock, you know, another powerhouse uh, female martial artist, uh, huge competitor back in the day. Um, who are some other martial artists that you've had the privilege to, to work with, collaborate with? Um, maybe just a couple that you want to shout out. Um, yeah, well, Cynthia is actually a Tung Sudo practitioner and we're from the same camp out in Western PA. So her instructor was my instructor, C.S. Kim, originally when she uh, was uh, training in Tung Sudo. So we have a little bit of a kindred spirit with that. Um, you know, I'm not real good at name dropping. I'm, I'm actually not real good with names, as you kind of might know. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't really, um, I, I, you know, I try to love everybody. And then at the same time, I'm very much a lone wolf. And I don't know if that makes sense, but that's just the way that I'm wired. So I don't really... I see people at certain events and the people that you think would impress me probably don't. And the people that you probably never heard of are probably the ones that impress me more than anything, to be honest, because I'm looking for the inside stuff in people and what makes them tick. And there's some incredible martial arts people out there that most people probably don't even know about that. Uh, you know, I have come to, to meet or discover and, you know, I, I I'm thoroughly impressed with other people. So uh, that's probably the best way I can handle that. But yeah, in our arena, there's a lot of impressive people and, um, you know, God bless them. I wish them well. It was cutting out just a little bit there. I don't know if it was the internet connection or or not, but, uh, you know, thank, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you're right. I think that there are a lot of unsung heroes that, uh, that, that just don't get their, um, their praise for being a strong martial artist. But I can appreciate you saying that. And Johnny just wanted to say uh, he wants to thank you for, for her help as he's an American Indian also as is her. So thanks again, Johnny. Thanks for watching, bud. Um, I, gosh, Johnny, Johnny Foster. I remember when Blake was just a little kid, but, but, but Johnny and his wife were always at all the tournaments that I went. And I can remember being a young kid, seeing Johnny, he's been around for a long, long time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yes. And he looks like Elvis a lot. <laughs> he does. He does. You know, let's let's talk about um let's talk about John Corcoran, who was a mentor of yours and um was uh someone that I had a lot of respect for. I don't know if you knew this, but I was also a columnist for MA Success. And and uh, I know that, Jason. Come on. <laughs> John John was I mean, John was an amazing person in the way that he always 
told me when my articles were good and he told me when my articles could have been better. He was, he was very honest that way. Uh, yeah. But talk a, li- talk a little bit about John. You know, that's Corky. <laughs> um, yeah, he was like that. He made no bones of telling you. I mean, I, I've seen him make, you know, almost bring people to tears. <laughs> I, I'm very fortunate because John Corcoran uh, picked about four or five people in his life to be his, his hands-on, even sometimes last minute writers to contribute to stuff. And um, let's see, I was working for an NBC affiliate in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I would, I'd already been, you know, I'm, I've already been a journalist. So that's my point of bringing that up. But I wanted to try to break into some martial arts magazines as a writer. So I submitted some, so submitted some stuff to CFW Enterprise, which was inside karate, inside Taekwondo, no longer exists today. John Corcoran was the editor of a couple of those magazines. And when I put my submission in, um, he immediately, you know, picked up with me and contacted me. He goes, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I want to do a story on you because you are a rare female who's actually on TV. It'll be a really cool story. So let's do this. And uh, he actually says, I'm going to try to find a writer in your area to work with. I said, you know, John, I actually am a writer. He goes, okay, well, you write it and submit it to me and let's take a look at it. So I wrote it and I submitted it. It was a feature right up on me, actually. Um, <laughs> and he, he actually said, Karen, this is very good. He goes, this is incredible writing. I'm sorry, Jason. I, <laughs> I'm not bragging. Um, but I'm just going to tell you how it worked out. He actually gave me my own column at that time. And that was early 90s. And he was, I'm going to give you your own magazine column. And um, I'm fortunate that Corcoran, uh, Corky, we call him, found, found favor in me as a writer. And I touched him for some reason. And we had a very longstanding friendship uh, for, you know, almost 30 years before he passed away. And uh, he, I know he had the purpose of making sure that he brought people up under him to continue writing. So that when he crossed over, he would there would be nobody because there's not a lot of us martial arts journalists. There, there's just not that many out there, especially now. Um, Charles Stephan passed, and some of the old timers who were doing this early on, uh, you know, there there's there's not that many people left. So uh, being able to pass, you know, the battalion on to somebody else is important, and I also try to keep that in mind when I'm working with young writers. And a lot of times they will contact me, and I'll realize what Cor- Corky taught me: you're not going to be here forever, Karen. You need to be able to pass that along and get other people ready and trained to do it. Yeah, he was he was very, uh, like I said, very straightforward and very honest. Uh, he always brought out the best in, in my writing. I know he did in you. And and so talk about how you um, you started your book. You, you've actually written three. You, you've been published three times, correct? Four. Four times. Okay. So yeah. talk about those different publications. Uh, it all started with I Am a Martial Artist, though. No, it actually, that was the first book that Century Martial Arts picked up. But okay. my first publishing was a major publishing with Simon and Schuster Macmillan books. And it was called, uh, I don't know if you remember the complete idiot series, the complete idiots guide mm-hmm. to playing golf, to finance. Mm-hmm. I wrote the one, um, the complete idiots guide to Taekwondo. So that book set me in place and John Corcoran helped me get that deal. And oh, man, it was a time in my life where I was so busy and so much was going on in my personal life that, uh, I actually told him, um, I, I think he should get somebody else. And he threw, he threw the book back at me, the, the, the prototype and goes, no, you're going to do it because it's going to set you as a writer. So that was my first major publishing and being a TSD practitioner and that being a TKD book, uh, we actually worked with Keith Yates. Everybody knows him as a well-established author to do all the TKD writing because I don't train in TKD, but I did everything else, the philosophy, the entire book, uh, the structure and the production of it. And so I got that book in and that was the first book that, pretty much gave me an elevator right up as an established writer. Um, And then I wrote, uh, I am a martial artist. Um, That's a good story. If you have a minute, that came from a poem that I put in the magazine um, called, I am a martial artist. And I see through different eyes. I see a different picture when other people see gray skies. And that really touched a lot of people. I mean, it just, the fan mail, the, the response to that poem, just was off the charts. So we decided to make a a book out of that one poem and an entire product line, t-shirts, mugs, 
um, you know, bookmarks, you name it. And it, it went all over the world and became a really big product. And I believe they've sold out of that book. And I'm not real sure if they're going to bring it back because it's several years old now. But the follow up to that book is They Call Me Master. I actually have it here. Oh, nice. <laughs> they, they Call Me Master is also available through Century Martial Arts, guys. And it's more martial arts philosophy. And it's a continuum of I am a martial artist. And uh, my, my last book I have, which has nothing to do with martial arts, Jason, is a self-help book called Will I Ever Feel Happy Again? And I want to talk about this for just a second because it, it deals with people that have survived the suicide of a loved one. And that's a real problem in our country today. And unfortunately, I've had to deal with this in my own family three times over. And so um, I know what that feels and I know what, what you go through with someone who loses a loved one uh, to suicide and the guilt and the shame and, and the hopelessness you feel. So what I did was I, I interviewed several people that have lost a loved one to suicide and they're in this book and they talk about how they got their happiness back after such a horrifying event. That's available on Amazon.com. And it's also available on, on BarnesandNoble.com. And uh, I'm listed as Karen Eden Herdman. So if you're someone struggling with this, please feel free to go get that book. Um, it's endorsed by the American Suicide Foundation. And I think that you'll find it very helpful. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, so thanks for sharing that and letting everybody know. Um, is there plans for another book? Um, you know, I get asked that and I know people are getting antsy for me to put something out. I, um, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not real sure if I want to stick with the martial arts philosophy. Honestly, Jason, it may be more of an inspirational spiritual journey type book and it's going to have uh, probably have religious overtones like my blog, the Eden Assignment Inspirational Series uh, is a radio blog and a group page, a Facebook page. And it has, it's, it's a very, it's a very spiritual um, uh, show and it's a very, you know, very spiritual writing and blogs. And I mean, you, you wouldn't think that maybe people would be interested, but I, that's probably my biggest blog with over 5,000 followers just on that one, I know people are searching for answers and I'm glad to help them in that capacity. Most people don't know this, but I'm also an ordained chaplain. So I'm very glad to help people uh, on their spiritual journey. And if you want to go look that up, and that is the Eden Assignment Inspirational Series. The reason why I call it the Eden Assignment is because as a TV reporter for about 25 years, I was always taking assignments that were given to me and mandated. And now I say I'm taking assignments from a different boss and I'm covering a totally different um, a journey with my assignments. And so that's why it's called that. So I want to encourage people, um, you know, to go ahead and seek out that it's a very important part of your life. Jason, we say body, mind, and spirit in martial arts, right? Yes, so yes, the right. body, we train the mind, we study. So few of us in martial arts work on the spiritual aspect and it's the most important one of the three balances of that triangle. So I encourage people to, to be spiritual, to help you along your journey, because that's really what matters the most. And you talk about, you know, being a, uh, being on the news, being on a, a TV news. What this is backtracking a little bit because this actually predates um, some of your martial arts um, teaching. So let's back up and talk about that a little bit. What, what was it like to be a newscaster and be, be on TV and do that whole thing? Well, uh, my official title, I was a weekday reporter and I was the weekend meteorologist. And um you know, I, I, it's not like I even graduated high school and go, oh, I'm going to be the weather girl. <laughs> I didn't do anything like that. I don't know. It's kind of like everything just sort of sort of fell in place. I knew that I wanted to be on TV. It was a very selfish time in my life. I had a lot of stuff to prove to people, especially people that, you know, were supposed to love and support and take care of me when I was younger. And, you know, I kind of gotten a stamp that I was going to be the world's biggest loser because of what the things that I went through growing up. And, Honestly, I probably should be the world's biggest loser, but I had a lot to prove at that time in my life. And I'm going to be very honest. I just wanted to be a TV star and whatever it took, how fast I could get there and how high I could climb was all that mattered to me at that point in my life. And I did a major switch over uh, uh, about 10 years later. And I, I got a little bit older in my late 20s and early 30s where God kind of came calling on me. And I realized why I really am here. And that's where I'm at right now with that. But um, I loved the job. I absolutely loved it. I loved the writing. I loved the reporting. I loved being on camera. Uh, but I hated the business. <laughs> it's a very brutal business. 
it's a very mean, nasty, backstabbing business. And I don't miss that at all. People ask me if I'd like to get back into news and the answer is absolutely not. I have no desire to do it. I'm very happy with where I'm at right now. So um, that's kind of the, that business in a nutshell for me is my experience. So it was a fun time in your life then, but looking back, um, it just was not the experience that you were truly looking for. It wasn't, it wasn't as fulfilling, I'm sure, as what you're doing now. Um, it, it was a, it was a fun time in a very selfish way. Everybody wants to be a star, you know, <laughs> especially if you grow up mistreated, you're like, oh yeah. And it's, it's fun that you can't go out anywhere without somebody wanting your autograph. You know, it's, it's fun that people look at you and whisper and you know, it's because they know you from TV. Uh, it's fun to be recognized. It, it fulfills, um, a, uh, sometimes people that have a hole in their soul, it fulfills a lot of that, but in a very empty way. Because true fulfillment is only going to become from is only going to be something that comes from you being able to understand why you're really here and what you're supposed to be doing and how your past fits into what you're supposed to be doing. That's when you're really going to get that feeling of peace. Having fun, Jason, and having peace, totally two different things. Definitely, definitely. And, and only wisdom can teach you that. Only years of experience can teach you that, right? Because we were all young at, at once and, uh, and kind of selfish that way. So yes, absolutely. I, I can totally understand that. You know, as a, so as a writer, um, uh, do you journal, you know, your thoughts? Because, you know, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of things going on. And, and do you journal? Do you write? Um, do you... Uh, keep track of these things so that maybe if you do want to write again, that, that that's there for you or something that maybe you do just for yourself. I got to tell you, I recently um, during the COVID experience was like many, I cleaned out my basement <laughs> and I actually came across, I mean, a large box full of journals from the time I was 12 years old. And um, I read through all of those, you know, now being who I am at my age, looking at me as a 12 year old and honestly, it brought tears to my eyes more than once. Um, I went through that process and be, going through those journals was a very healing process for me and I could put it away. And I actually had a somewhat of a burning ceremony with what I had in that bag of some of those, those things that I went through and it was very healing for me. Um, as I got older and became a little bit more of a complete person, not that I'm still not on that journey, I got away from the journaling because I started to put a lot of that into uh, what am I doing to help people and make a difference? And that became very healing for me. Um, so no, to answer your question today, I don't personally journal, but I do have to come up with all these karate columns, right? So right. <laughs> sometimes people will come up with something or I'll be in a conversation with someone and go, wow, that is a great karate column. And I will jot it down or I'll email myself on my phone, the topic. And I actually have an entire box on my desk packed with uh, thought, starter, uh, thought starters for a column in this box on just scraps of paper that I've written over 20 years. And so every month or whenever my columns do, I'll pull it out and go, well, I can do that. That's timely. Let's write on this. So that's how that works for me. And you're still writing for, for MA Success. Are you writing for any other publications? I still write for MA Success. I'm still... Um, a uh, columnist and contributor for Taekwondo Times, even though they're going through some changes right now. Um, and both of those I have been writing for, for over 20 years. And then I had my column in Inside Taekwondo before they bellied up, um, you know, before that. So I've been writing a long, long time as far as in martial arts columns and magazines. I probably, honestly, I say this, I've probably been featured in every major martial arts magazine uh, many times over, whether it's Black Belt or, uh, you know, you name it. Early on and over the last 20 years, I've either written for or been featured in all in every magazine you can think of. What, what would you say is, is the biggest highlight in your career as a writer? Uh, my biggest highlight is when I, I have my books and, and I, I, you know, I just recently went to Cleveland and, and I had some of my books with me. And like yourself, when you told me early on that, I've actually reread your book that I read 10 years ago. That means more to me than anything because it means that I have actually put me, Karen Eden, on paper and somebody got something out of it. You know, as writers, you know this, we start like an artist. We look at something white and blank staring back at us, whether it's a canvas or, uh, you know, a, a page on your computer. And you 
you pour, you put your heart on that piece of white paper or that white canvas, and you hope that people are going to be able to relate to it. And when they can relate to it and they react to it, it's the greatest compliment of all. So I would have to say just people coming up going, I loved your book. I read your book. I loved your book. That's you can't put a price on that. Excellent. Well, listen, uh, as we start to wrap up, you know, again, I just want to thank you for being on the show and being candid and honest. One of the things that I, I love most about you, and we talked about this uh, very early on, was that, you know, you're the real deal. You say it like it is. You don't pull any punches. Um, I think that we need more of that. Um, and, and people really living their truth um, rather than, you know, suppressing that and, and holding that back because you just never know what you have to say could really change a life and that and changing that one life can change many lives you know one of the things that that we do as martial arts instructors is we teach our students but we don't always realize that those students go out into the world and spread what they've been taught with you know tens hundreds thousands of people uh the ripple effect of, of our teaching is is just amazing and uh, i just want to thank you again for being a someone that, that i really have been inspired from not only reading your book but just in conversations i really you know i can respect the 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 strong personality that you have um i think that that's you know important as a, as a female martial artist to represent the other girls in martial arts that know that, hey, it's not just the guy's sport. You know, I have a, I have a daughter who's now 19. Um, I always loved watching her do martial arts. My wife is a, is a fourth degree black belt in martial arts. I love that strong female personality. Uh, sometimes it's tough, but uh, for, the <laughs> most part, for the most part, I, I truly do appreciate it. So, um, and Johnny's just jumping in here real quick. He's, I think he's stepping out. And uh, bowing to you, sir, as well. Thank you. But I want to give you a minute, Karen. Um, can you please just share your final thoughts, uh, a little bit more of your philosophy? And, and just for the people that are watching now, the people that will watch later, um, give them just some of your final thoughts. Absolutely. I want to kind of piggyback on what were you, you were saying. You know, everybody that is a human being that walks this planet has something. Everybody has something they go through. You know, it's like the line, nobody gets through this world without their shared pain. You know, if, if you if you haven't, you've been extremely blessed. But everybody goes through something at some point in their life. Um, and, you know, I believe that if, if you've gone through struggles, your goal is to be able to be a strong enough person inside to say, I'm going to take what I've gone through to try to help other people so that maybe they'll have comfort or maybe they'll do it with my help in a different way that's that's going to be easier for them on their journey. And that's what we do. I mean, even in martial arts, when we teach, we say, OK, make sure you 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 pivot your bottom leg when you throw that round kick, because I'm telling you, if you don't, you're going to hurt your hip because maybe we didn't do it right. And we hurt our hip doing that. You know, it's the same thing. And, and mind and spirit as well, where you want to try to take the experiences that you've learned that have been hard knocks in your life and try to help the next generation coming up or help people who are going through a hard time. Ultimately, that's what we're designed for. And whether you've been on TV, books, movies, magazines, product, public relations, speaking gigs, all these things that I've been very fortunate and blessed to have, none of it matters if you don't help mentor people who may be struggling and with your own experience. That's the most important thing out there. And I thank you for giving me a chance to say that. And I would like to encourage you guys to buy my books because <laughs> I wrote them. <laughs> and, and I would like to be able to, to um, know that they're making a difference as well. So with that, Jason, I just have to say, God bless you guys. You take care and make sure you listen to my blogs and go to the Eden Assignment on Facebook. And if you want to be part of the spiritual journey. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much. And feel free uh, after we um, after we finish this um, video here, you can post it in the comments. That way people have links that they can go to the care needed assignment. They can check out where to get your books. Okay. Um, I know that everybody would benefit, uh, whether you're a martial artist or not. Um, I, I really don't think that that matters. I think that you'll truly right. enjoy the books. Um, but let me just quickly give a, a couple announcements of, of what we got coming up on Master Motivation. So this week, I actually have a, another special edition of Master Motivation with uh, Chris Casamasa will be on this Wednesday at 12 o'clock. And then next week we'll be on with Dave Kovar, 
Jose Escobar will follow after that, my great friend Danny Cleary, and so many more each and every Monday right here on the Master Motivation. So Master Karen, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate you. Thank you for all that you do in the world and keep making a difference. Gotcha. Appreciate you. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, guys. Have a great day and we will see you next Monday.